Director of Hart Senate Office Building Room 216 for the third day of hearings for Chief Justice nominee John Roberts, set to begin any minute now. Senator Arlen Specter, the chairman of the committee, is there, as is the nominee John Roberts. Here's how the schedule lays out for today. The committee will wrap up with uh, two more rounds of 30-minute questions. First, Senator Sam Brownback of Kansas, and then Senator Tom Coburn. Following that, they'll move on to a round of 20-minute questions. Each of the 18 senators on the committee will get questions for 20 minutes. They're expected to break for lunch at around 1 o'clock Eastern. Back at 2, resuming the round of 20-minute questions, 2 Eastern. We'll continue with live coverage, of course, and wrapping up sometime later this afternoon. At the end of questions, the committee will go into a closed session to review the FBI report on John Roberts. And tomorrow, the schedule is set for the committee to hear from other witnesses on the nomination of John Roberts. That's Senator Coburn, Senator Brownback, left and right. They'll have the, uh, the first round here of 30-minute questions once the hearing gets underway. Proceed with the confirmation hearing of Judge Roberts to be Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, one uh, preliminary statement. I uh, noted after the session yesterday uh, that there was some comment about my statement when I uh, ask Senator Biden to allow you to continue to respond or to respond at all. And he then interjected that you were misleading the committee. Uh, my statement was, while they may be misleading, they are his answers. It was in the subjunctive, and I was not suggesting that your answers were misleading. But uh, in that moment, the object was to let you answer. If uh, somebody wants to characterize them one way or another, uh, they can do that and you can respond. And I was not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that they were misleading. And you picked it right up and said that they uh, weren't misleading. 
Uh, there are sometimes differences of opinion between the person asking the question and the person answering the question, but there was no doubt in my mind as to the fact that they were not misleading. We now uh, proceed with the final two senators on the opening 30-minute uh, round, and I recognize uh, Senator Brownback. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, How are you, Ernest? welcome you. Morning. Uh, Judge Roberts, uh, Mrs. Roberts, glad to have you here this morning. You're only two away from uh, the end <laughs> of this round, and we'll see how much uh, further it goes. I hope you had a good night's sleep, and I um, thought you had a great uh, presentation yesterday. I want to compliment you on the number of areas that you answered. Uh, you went, uh, my colleague from Texas went through the number of areas and commented about that yesterday, and I was very impressed with the uh, breadth, obviously, of your knowledge. and. Um, and your forthcomingness, how many of these areas you answered where prior nominees had not put answers forth. And so I think you've revealed a great deal and yet not gone into those areas of uh, active judicial um, action where there could be a lot of things coming forward. I also want to compliment the chairman, uh, Chairman Spector, who originates from my home state and his stamina. Uh, he's uh, been going through um, a lot lately, the chairman has, and yet uh, you've pressed this committee so that uh, many of us have difficulty keeping up with you, uh, and I want to compliment you on that stamina and the ability that you uh, that you show. You always set a fast pace. Well, Senator Brownback, being a Kansan yourself, you know where that stamina came from because uh, I'm a Kansan myself. It's standing in the wind all day long. You just have to lean into it. It makes it, it strengthens you quite a bit. I want to uh, go to a few areas that you haven't answered uh, questions on yet. Uh, it may be a surprise to some watching if there are any areas left, but actually there are quite a few. And with your service on the court, you know on the bench, you're going to get such a range of issues and topics that are going to come up. Uh, it is noteworthy to me that uh, a majority, a, a super majority of committee members have asked you about privacy uh, and leading up to questions on Roe, which I think only makes the point that this is an issue should be left into the political system and not into the judicial system where it is today. That's something you'll have to resolve as issues like partial birth abortion come up to you. But the very dominance of the question bespeaks of its interest within the political system and why it's best resolved within the political system and not the judicial one on a constitutional basis. But I'll, I'll get to that later. I want to take you first to the takings clause issue. There's a recent case that came up that really shocked the system. And you talked about shocks to the system when the judiciary acts. Uh, this is one that did it in the Kelo versus New London case. Uh, in perhaps no other area of the law is stability more important than in the area of private property and property rights. Even before the existence of the United States, William Blackstone, that famous English legal authority, stated this. He stated, quote, the law of the land postpones even public necessity to the sacred and inviolable rights of private property. Mindful of this sentiment and the excesses of the king, yet aware of the needs of a new and growing country, the framers of our Constitution established a strict limitation on the government's ability to take private property. The Takings Clause of the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution provides that private property may not, quote, be taken for public use without just compensation. We all know those famous words. Traditionally, this has meant that the government had to pay fair value when it sought to confiscate a homeowner's property in order to build a road or other public good. But now the notion of public use has taken a different hue to it. In this Kelo versus the City of New London case, the Supreme Court had decided whether a private economic development plan, which a city government believed would yield greater economic benefits, qualified as a public use. So you had private property taken by the state and given back to private individuals, but it was having a greater economic use, and whether that was sufficient under the takings clause. In the words of the court, this economic development plan, quote, was projected, not resulted, but projected to create an excess of a thousand jobs to increase taxes and other revenues. On this basis, the court upheld the government confiscation as a public use, and there was an outroar across the country. We thought that property, property rights, private property rights were established and set. And now it appears as if it's not, that the system is different. You can take private property by the government's eminent domain ability and give it back to a private individual. 
Justice O'Connor, in her eloquent dissent, quotes this, nothing is to prevent the state now from replacing any Motel 6 with a Ritz-Carlton, any home with a shopping mall, or any farm with a factory. It is remarkable how this issue is stirred, as I mentioned, great criticism. I'm pleased the chairman's going to hold a hearing on it this next week. Judge Roberts, what is your understanding of the state of the takings clause jurisprudence now after Kelo? Isn't it now the case that it's much easier for one man's home to become another man's castle? Well, um, under the Kelo decision, uh, which, as you explained, was interpreting the public use requirement uh, in the Constitution, um, uh, the majority, and of course, as you mentioned, it was a closely divided case, uh, the majority explained its reasoning by uh, noting the difficulty in drawing the line. Everybody would agree as you suggest, to build a road or to build a, a railroad, uh, to situate a military base if that's the only suitable place, that the power of eminent domain uh, is appropriate in those instances. And I think people agree further that when you're talking about a hospital or, or something like that, uh, that satisfies public use. Um, and I think the reason, uh, the reason the court gave, really, in the majority opinion was that it's kind of hard to to draw the line. Uh, the dissent, uh, Justice O'Connor's dissent, uh, uh, didn't think it was that hard. Uh, uh, she focused on the question of whether it was going to be a use open to the public, as you know, a road, a hospital, use for the public, like in a military base, or private. And she would have drawn the line there and said, even public benefits that derive from different private uses don't justify that, that aspect of it. Um, there was a uh, caveat in the Kelo majority. They said they were only deciding this in the context of an urban redevelopment plan. They reserved the question if it's just taking one parcel and giving it to somebody else, not part of a broader plan. That question was still open. Uh, and as you said, there's been a lot of reaction to it. I understand some states have even legislated uh, restricting their power. And we are considering it here in the Congress. And I think um, uh, that's a very ap appropriate approach to consider. In other words, the court was not saying you have to have this power, you have to exercise this power. What the court was saying is there is this power, and then it's up to the legislature to determine whether it wants that to be available, whether it wants it to be available in limited circumstances, or whether it wants to go back to uh, the, an understanding like, as reflected in the dissent, that this is not an appropriate uh, uh, public use. Uh, th that leaves the the, the ball in the court of the legislature. And I, I think it's uh, reflective of what is often the case, um, and people sometimes lose sight of, that uh, this body and legislative bodies in the states uh, are protectors of the people's rights as well. It's not simply a question of legislating to address particular needs, but you obviously have to also be cognizant of the people's rights, and you can protect them in situations where the court has determined, as it did uh, five to four in Kilo, that they are not going to draw that line. You still have the authority to draw. I, I understand the authority we maintain. What I'm curious about is your view is, does that right exist? I would not think Blackstone would agree that that right uh, exists for the public to take private property for, public, for private use. Well, in, in, you know, the first year in law school, we all read the decision in Calder against Bull, uh, which has the famous statement that the government may not take the property of A and give it to B. Um, uh, and that certainly was quoted in the, in the dissent, in Justice O'Connor's dissent. Um, um, the Kelo majority, though, said if a legislature wants to exercise that power, basically that the court's not going to second guess the judgment that this is a public use. Um, and I do think that imposes a heavy responsibility on the legislature to determine what they're doing and whether it is a public use or if it's simply transferring from one private party to the next. But um, I take it you're not going to respond whether or not that, that right is, uh, exists under the Constitution. Well, I, I, uh, the Kelo decision obviously was just decided last year, and, and I don't think I should comment whether it was correct or not. Um, it stands as a precedent of the court. It did leave open the question of whether it applied in a situation that was not a broader uh, redevelopment plan, but, um, uh, I, and if the issue does come back before the court, I need to be able to address it without having 
previously commented on it. Let me take you to another area that's um, that's stewing here in legislative bodies, uh, certainly across the United States and certainly in Congress, and that's the issue of checks and balances of the court. Um, any civic student can talk about uh, checks and balances within the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch. And we all know that Congress, when it passes a bill, can be checked by a veto of the president. And we know the president's power can be uh, checked by the power of the purse in the Congress, those checks and balances. And when popular elected branches of government enact bills contrary to the Constitution, the courts can strike the, the law down by exercising judicial review. Uh, one curiosity, though, especially given the broad sweep of judicial power in America today and the, the angst that that stirs amongst so many people, is what check there is on the court and what checks there exist on the court. And it seems to me critical that we have this discussion uh, at this point in, ta point in time. First check on the judiciary, of course, is the president's ability to populate the bench, of which you are a nominee, and our ability on advice and consent. The greater problem arises once a federal judge is on the bench, and what's in Article 3, Section 1, and this is getting a lot of discussion now here in this body, where judges hold office during good behavior, which I know you will have, and effectively have life tenure. But that's not really an effective check in the system. There is also another area that you wrote about uh, when you were uh, working within the Reagan uh, administration, that was the ability of Congress to, live, to limit the authority and the review uh, of, con of the courts, of what you would have. Um, and I want to look at that in particular. It's the power to define jurisdiction that uh, we would have. It's in Article 3, Section 2, and I just want to read this because I don't think it's well understood as the check and balance, and I want to get your reaction to it. This is Article 3, Section 2. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, councils, and those in which a state may be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. No question there. goes on. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction both as to law and fact with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. This last phrase, you know, is, is known as the Exceptions Clause. You wrote about this when you were in the Reagan White House, uh, about this Exception Clause, and you stated this. It stands as a <laughs> plenary grant of power to Congress to make exceptions to the appellant jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The clause, by its terms, contains no limit. This is your, these are your words, and, quote, this clear and unequivocal language is the strongest argument in favor of congressional power and the inevitable stumbling block for those who would read the clause in a more restrictive fashion. Now, I understand that you also argued on policy grounds this is not a good idea for the Congress to do, but would you agree with those earlier statements that you made about the nature of this power being a plenary power of the Congress uh, and stands as a clear uh, uh, standard in favor of the Congress to be able to limit the jurisdiction of the courts? Well, um, you know, Senator, that that uh, writing was done at the request of the Attorney General, and he asked me specifically to present the arguments in favor of that power. He was receiving from elsewhere in the Department a memorandum saying that this was unconstitutional, the exercise of that authority. He wanted to see the other view before making up his mind for the Department. So I was tasked to present the arguments in favor of constitutionality. And as you say, they focus and start with the language in the Constitution, the Exceptions Clause, uh, which is, as you read it, um, and I went on to explain that it had been interpreted in the famous case of ex-party McArdle around the time of the Civil War, which seemed to suggest that the framers uh, meant what that language says on its, on its face. Uh, also, though, a later case, uh, United States against Klein, uh, suggested that there were limits uh, on the power of Congress in this area. It is a central debate uh, among legal scholars. Um, uh, the scope of that authority. The argument on the other side, uh, the one that the Attorney General adopted, uh, rather than the argument he asked me to present, is that it is the in essential function of the Supreme Court to provide uniformity and consistency in federal law, and that if you carve out exceptions in the, its core constitutional area, that you deprive it of that ability, and that that itself violates the constitutional scheme. It's, a, it's an area in which most distinguished scholars line up on either side uh, because it does call into question basic relationships between the Congress uh, and, and the courts. Um, could, the, could that language be any clearer, though, in the exceptions clause? 
I mean, no. I understand how legal scholars maybe can debate what a single word means, but that language is pretty clear, isn't it? The argument on the other side says that it's intended to apply to, well, for example, we have clear situations uh, in the lower federal courts, like the amount in controversy, those cases are excluded. Uh, you can have rules about timing, you know. If you, uh, uh, the, the question is whether it was intended to address or constitutional areas or simply more administrative uh, matters. Uh, the argument on the other side says if you get into the core constitutional areas, uh, that undermines the Supreme Court's authority and that the framers didn't intend that. Well, it's then what check is there on the court's power? Well, I think the primary check. Uh, is the same one that uh, Alexander Hamilton talked about in the Federalist Papers, because the exact argument was raised uh, in the debates about the Constitution. People were concerned about a new judiciary. Uh, uh, what was it going to do? They were concerned that it might deprive them of their rights. And of course, Hamilton's famous answer was the judiciary was going to be the least dangerous branch because it had no power. It didn't have the sword. It didn't have the purse. Uh, and the judges were not going to be able to deprive people of their liberty because they were going to be bound down by rules and precedents. They were going to just interpret the law. And if judges just interpreted the law, there was no threat to liberty from the judicial branch. So I would say the primary check on the courts has always been judicial self-restraint and a recognition on the part of judges that they have a limited task, that they are insulated from the people. They're given life tenure, as you mentioned precisely because they're not shaping policy. They're not supposed to be responsive. They're supposed to just interpret the law. And I guess that's the area that has so many people concerned, is if the judiciary does not show restraint, and judicial restraint is the limitation on the courts, such as in the takings clause debate we just, uh, just had, really, where the court is saying, well, no, this is a broader power, uh, that if you don't restrain yourselves, then who, then who does? Uh, within this system. Obviously there's restraints on the Congress, there's restraints on the President. And we, we like that system, we want that check and balance system. I think the framers put that exceptions clause and other things in there for clear purpose uh, and for, for clear reason. But let me take you on to a, another area because that one I think you're going to see a lot of action as you get pushing back and forth between the three branches of government and a, a number of people feeling like the judiciary has, has not shown judicial restraint uh, in recent years. I want to take you to the now probably the most contentious social issue of our day, and you've been debating and discussing it a great deal here uh, already, uh, issue of abortion. It's at the um, root of much of the debate taking place in the country today. It uh, has inflamed people. It has gotten them involved in the political process, folks that probably wouldn't have been previously because the only way they saw that they could affect the system was get involved and try to elect a president, uh, Senate. Um, it was the president's lead applause line the last election cycle was I'll appoint judges who will be judges, not legislators. Uh, that's an applause line at a political rally should say something about people's angst towards what the courts have done and particularly then and rooted in this issue of abortion. The very root of the issue is the legal status of the unborn child. This is an old debate and whether that child is a person or is a piece of property is the root of that debate. Our legal system, everything's one of the two. You're either a person or you're a piece of property. If you're a person, you have rights. If you're a piece of property, you can be done with as your master chooses. And I believe everyone agrees that the unborn child is alive. And most agree that biologically it is a life. It's a separate genetic entity. But many will dispute whether it's a person. These may be legal definitions, but that's the way people would define it. Could you state your view? as to whether the unborn child is a person or is a piece of property? Well, Senator, because cases are going to come up in this area, and that could be the focus of legal argument in those cases, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment on that one way or another. Um, I will confront issues in this area as I would confront issues in any area that come before the court. Uh, and that would be to fully and fairly consider the arguments presented and decide them according to the rule of law. Um, and I don't think it would be appropriate for me to express uh, views in an area that could come before the court. I, I think we're in court. I hope you would agree with me that this is at the core of the issue. 
obviously the competition between the, the uh, woman's right to choose and the legal status of the unborn. And it permeates so much of our debate, and it's why a lot of us believe it should be within the political system to discuss. I want to point out one thing uh, to you, and I, I don't think this probably needs to be addressed, but I want to uh, point it out. In uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, it's been cited yesterday, along with the Brown decision, of which my state is the proud home state host of Brown versus Board of Education. And I personally uh, knew two of the lawyers that practiced in that, uh, in that case, and they were noble, noble gentlemen. They overturned Plessy, as you knew, and as you know, which was an 1896 case. So Plessy had stood for nearly 60 years. We've had a discussion about this um, super stare decisis uh, issue, and I just want to hold up a quick chart, uh, if I could, if I've got it back here. Uh, the notion that because Roe has not been overturned in 30-some cases makes it a super stare decisis, Plessy had not been overturned in a series of cases over a period of, of 60 years uh, where the court at each time looked at it, discussed it, decided against overturning it. Uh, yet I don't think anybody would uh, agree that Plessy shouldn't have been overturned. And certainly not anybody from my state, where the host state of Brown versus the Board of Education. But the notion that by tenure, a, a lay standing becomes a super starry decisis, or by number of times that it's been looked at, it becomes a super starry decisis, I just, I don't think finds a basis in law, nor in practicality, as you noted. And some of these decisions up there, I'd point out to you, are um, uh, pretty onerous statements that the court put forward itself. Uh, in, uh, in how they upheld Plessy for a number of years. And yet, thank goodness that the court overruled it in the Brown versus the Board of Education's uh, case that, that it eventually, um, eventually decided. I want to also point out to you something. You talked a lot about it yesterday, and I really appreciate this, about facts matter in a case. And judges decide cases. And cases are built on facts. And you have the facts and you have the law. Uh, but the facts matter. There's no one in my state that wouldn't be honored to show you the, the school building where uh, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education was decided. We just dedicated it last year. The president was there, 50th year anniversary. You can see the path where the little girl walked uh, to the school and had to walk by the all-white school to get there. And you look at that set of facts, and it, it, it's in, you look at it and you say, that's wrong. And you're ennobled that we no longer do that. I held a hearing earlier this year on the factual setting of Roe versus Wade and Doe v. Bolton, the factual setting of these two cases. The two plaintiffs in those cases testified in front of the Judiciary Subcommittee that I was there and Senator Feingold. Both of them talked about the false statements of record that were those cases were built upon, the false statements. Listen to this statement by uh, Sandra Kano. She's Doe of Doe v. Bolton. This is what she said. June 23, 2005, and Judiciary Subcommittee that I chaired. Quote, Doe v. Bolton falsely created the health exception that led to abortion on demand and partial birth abortion. This is her statements now. I, Sandra Kano, only sought legal assistance to get a divorce from my husband and to get my children from foster care. Abortion never crossed my mind, although apparently was on the mind of the attorney from whom I sought help. Further quote, at no time did I ever have an abortion. I did not seek an abortion, nor do I believe in abortion. This is Sandra Kano, the Doe of Dovey Bolton. And then she goes on to say, Dovey Bolton is based on lies and deceit. It needs to be retired, retried, or overturned, which she's trying to get it retried. Doe is against my wishes. Abortion is wrong. That's Doe of Dovey Bolton. Now here's Norman McCorvey of Roe of Roe v. Wade. This is just the factual setting. I believe I was used and abused by the court system in America. Instead of helping a woman in Roe v. Wade, I brought destruction to me and millions of women throughout the nation. Sandra McCorvey. Quote, this is really troubling too. I made up the story that I had been raped to help justify my abortion. Sandra McCorvey. Facts. Facts. In Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton falsified statements. And upon this, we've based 
this constitutional right that's been found that we now have 40 million fewer children in the country to bless us with? And I want to take another point on that to you. We've talked a lot about the disability community, and well we should, and the protection needed for the disability community. And that's important, and it, because I think it really, it helps people that need help, but it helps the rest of us to be more, much more human and caring. Senator Kennedy is helping me with a bill uh, because a number of children never get here that have disabilities. Unborn children prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome and other disabilities. I don't know if you know this, but there was a recent analysis and 80 to 90 percent of children prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome never get here. Never get here. They're, they're aborted in the system. And people just say, look, this child's got difficulties. And we even have waiting lists in America of people today willing to adopt children with Down syndrome. And we will protect that child as well we should under Americans with Disability Act and other issues when they get here. But so many, much of the time and with our increased ability of genetic testing, they don't get here. Diagnosed in the uh, womb system that encourages this child to be destroyed at that stage. And this is, this is all on the records. And we are the poorer for it as a society. All the members of this body know a young man with Down syndrome named Jimmy. Maybe you've met him even. He runs the elevator that takes the senators to up and down on the Senate floors. His uh, warm smile welcomes us every day. We're a better body for him. He told me the other day, uh, he frequently gives me a hug in the elevator afterwards. I know he does Senator Hatch often too, who kindly gives him ties some of which I question the taste of, Warren, but uh, he kindly gives, uh, gives ties. You didn't have to get personal. And uh, <laughs> Jimmy said to me the other day after he hugged me, he said, shh, don't tell my supervisor. They're telling me I'm hugging too many people. <coughs> and, and yet we're ennobled by him and what he does and how he lifts up our humanity. And 80 to 90 percent of the kids in this country like Jimmy never get here. What, what does that do to us? What does that say about us? And I would just ask you, Judge Roberts, to consider, and probably you can't answer here today, whether the individuals with disabilities have the same constitutional rights that you and I share while they're in the womb. Well, uh, Senator, I appreciate your uh, thoughts on the, on the subject very much. Um, I do think, though, since those precise questions could come before the court, that that is in the area that I have to refrain from answering. Well, I just, I hope one thinks about people like Jimmy and a system now that scientifically can, can figure out the nature of uh, this child's physical or mental state at an early point and is, is having many of them destroyed at that point in time. And that's, that's taking place in our, in our country today. I uh, have little time left. I want to uh, say one final thing to you, and, and, uh, and I appreciate you, and I appreciate your inability to answer some of these questions. They're, they're tough questions, and they're questions that are live in front of us as a society. I would just uh, ask you really about your mentor, or one of your mentors, and uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who uh, I admired greatly, admired, admired for his demeanor. Um, I, uh, as you go on, and I uh, anticipate you will be approved to be the Chief Justice of the United States, um, I would ask you just, if you could, briefly to respond, how, how do you view his mentorship of you and your taking over if you are confirmed as Chief Justice? I mean, what, what does that mean personally to you, and how will it impact you as Chief Justice? Well, it, it makes the opportunity uh, a very special one, as I've said before. Um, the Chief uh, was a mentor to many people, uh, and like many great mentors, of course, he led by example, uh, not by precept. Um, uh, his example of uh, how he dealt with other people, uh, 
not just other justices, uh, but everybody in the courthouse, um, including the, the law clerks, uh, in an open, uh, friendly, uh, balanced way, uh, was an example for everybody there. Um, substantively, his approach uh, to the role of a judge and the appropriate role of the court um, is, I think, a very important example. He was somebody who appreciated the limits uh, the appropriate limits on the judicial role and the judicial power, uh, and he was always careful and conscious of that. He was always asking whether or not this was something that it was appropriate for the courts to do. Um, and I do think it's important for judges at every level to always ask that question because, as we had talked earlier, uh, judicial self-restraint is the key check on the authority of the court. Um, and if you're not asking yourself that question at every stage, is this an appropriate thing for me to do as a judge, uh, then there's a great danger that you'll lose sight of that important judicial self-restraint. Thank you. And uh, God bless you and your service to the country and your family. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Senator Brownback. Uh, Senator Leahy has a doctor's appointment this morning, but will be joining us shortly. We now turn to Senator Coburn for his 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and again, welcome. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Uh, there were so many legal terms yesterday bandied around that I was having trouble grabbing hold of. I thought I'd start out with medical terms this morning and see if you could keep up. Uh, I, no. I, I also uh, thought it was interesting, since you've been prophesied to have 35 years, that's 12,675 12, days that the chairman uh, prophesies that you'll be there. You've passed three of them, and congratulations on number three. Uh, I want to go to something that Senator Kyle talked with you about, and I was very pleased with your answer. He asked you about uh, referencing and uh, using uh, preference uh, to select and pick uh, precedents from foreign law yesterday, and, and I thought you gave a, a very reassuring answer to the American public. You, you, you based your answer on two points. One is that the uh, democratic theory is that in this country, with our law, the people are involved in that, both through the Senate, the, uh, the House, and the President who appoints you. The other point you made uh, is that, that relying on foreign precedent does not confine judges. Uh, and I, I just want to kind of ask a couple of questions. Number one, the oath that you took for your appellate position and the oath that you will take states the following, that I, John Roberts, do solemnly swear that I will administer justice without respect to persons and do equal right to the poor and to the rich, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon me, John Roberts, under the Constitution and the laws of the United States. So help me God. My question uh, relates to the Constitution and what is said in Article 3 that judges both of the Supreme and inferior courts shall hold their offices during good behavior. My question to you is relying on foreign precedent and selecting and choosing a foreign precedent to create a bias outside of the laws of this country, is that good behavior? Well, I. For the reasons I stated yesterday, I don't think it's a, um, a good approach. Um, um, the, I wouldn't accuse judges or justices who disagree with that, though, of violating their, their oath. I'd accuse them of, of getting it wrong on that point, and I'd hope to sit down with them and, and uh, debate it and uh, uh, reason about it. But um, uh, I, I think the justices who reach a contrary result on those questions uh, are operating in good faith and uh, trying, as, as I do on the court I am on now, uh, to live up to that oath that you, you read. I, I wouldn't want to suggest that they're, that they're not doing that. I, again, I would think they're, they're not getting it right in that particular case and uh, with that particular approach and would hope to be able to uh, sit down and, and argue with it, as I suspect they'd like to sit down and debate with me, but I, I wouldn't suggest they're not operating in good faith to comply can, with Can the American people count on you to not use foreign precedents in your decision making on the Supreme Court? I, I, you know, I will follow the Supreme Court's precedents uh, uh, consistent with the principles of stare decisis. And there are cases in this area, of course, that's why we're having the debate. The court has uh, looked at those. Um, 
I, I think it's fair to say those uh, in the prior opinions, those are not determinative uh, in the sense that the precedent turned entirely on foreign law. Uh, so it's not a question of whether or not you'd be departing from these cases if you decided not to use foreign law. Um, and for the reasons I gave yesterday, um, uh, and I I'm going to be that. looking. And I, I respect that. And I know that you can't be in a position to make a judgment on that. But I, again, for the record, I want to read what the Constitution says. The judges, both of the Supreme and Inferior Court, shall hold their offices during good behavior, and that the oath that they take references only the Constitution and the laws of this country. And, and uh, if anything, I would like to send a message uh, that that's what their oath states. Uh, and, and this ju judicial restraint that you've spoken of, I believe, uh, includes that oath and the definition that our founders believed when they said, here's what you should base your decisions on, is the Constitution of the United States and the laws. The other thing, you, uh, yesterday you had an exchange with uh, Senator Feingold um, on a case, um, and I think it was the Gonzaga case, and, and you, 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 you talked about congressional intent. And, and I'd like for you to, for a moment, to spend a minute giving us a, your opinion, and you may refuse to do so if you care to, uh, that would be your pr privilege. But one of my observations is that oftentimes we don't do a very good job with the laws that we write because we're not very clear. Uh, sometimes we're lazy, sometimes we're politically expedient, but oftentimes the very problems that you as a court make uh, controversial decisions over are because we've not done a good job. And I'd just like your thoughts as to if you were to critique things that we could do better to make your job uh, easier and clearer, uh, what would you have to say to that? Well, um, sitting where I am, I'm not terribly inclined to be critical of uh, <laughs> uh, the Congress um, and wouldn't be as, uh, uh, in any event. But um, a lot of what judges spend their time doing, uh, not always in the momentous constitutional cases that we've been talking about, but sometimes in very mundane cases, is the effort to discern congressional intent. Uh, trying to figure out what Congress meant when it used specific words that were passed by both houses and signed by the President uh, into law. Uh, now some of that is, is entirely unavoidable. Uh, the complexity of human endeavor is such that situations are going to arise that are not clearly answered by even the most specific language. Um, and that's to be expected and judges uh, have to address those situations. But as you suggest your, your, yourself in your, in your question, there are situations where uh, uh, sometimes Congress punts the issue to the courts. Uh, they can't come to an agreement about how a particular provision should be applied and so folks who want it to go one way uh, and folks who want it to go the other way just sort of leave it ambiguous or leave it out and, and uh, take their chances in court. Um, and obviously that's a different situation and uh, I think all judges uh, would tell you that to the extent Congress can address the issues and resolve the issues that are the policy questions entrusted to them, it, it makes it a lot easier for the courts uh, to decide the cases that do come up because then it's just a question of looking at the facts and the law is clear and you apply the facts uh, to the law. Uh, if the, the law is unclear, uh, uh, that makes it uh, that much more difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, obviously a lot of these situations are unavoidable, but there are certainly, a, and, and the, the Supreme Court has addressed uh, many of these, the issue of implied rights of action in the past, and they were getting case after case after case, and they finally adopted an approach in the early 1980s that said, look, we're not, we're not going to imply rights of action anymore. Congress, if you want somebody to have a right of action, just say so. Um, uh, but uh, this is not a good thing for the courts to be doing, deciding whether a particular right of action should be implied or not. And after the court developed that jurisprudence in the early 80s, um, uh, you know, the, the hope was, and I think it has been realized to a large extent, that there would be more addressing of that question in Congress, which is where it should be addressed. And, and you would agree we could do a better job 
Well, I, I'm sure everyone's doing as good a job as they as they can, uh, and uh, that, that's the first answer I worry about uh, that you've given <laughs> the whole testimony. Let me, let me go to another area. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm a, a practicing physician, kind of an old-time GP. I've delivered 4,000 babies. I take care of people at the end of life, at the beginning of life. Um, <clears throat> in all 50 states, death is recognized and defined as the irreversible cessation of brain and heart activity. Do you have any reason to dispute that? Um, I, I don't know the medical terms or definitions, but uh, no. It's, I mean, if that's the law in the states, now, that's not to say that it has any particular legal significance. Right. I'm not, cases, I'm not but, asking you about legal significance. Uh, would you agree that the opposite of being dead is being alive? All right, Patrick. In the, yes. Again, it means... <laughs> Hold it out of him. Uh, don't mean to be overly cautious in the answer. You, you know I'm going somewhere. Um, one of the problems I have is coming up with with just the common sense and logic that if if brainwave and heartbeat signifies life. A de the absence of them signifies death, then the presence of them certainly signifies life. Uh, and to say otherwise, uh, logically, is, is schizophrenic. Uh, and, and that's how I view a lot of the, the decisions that have come from the Supreme Court on the issue of abortion. Uh, and and I, I, I won't press you on this issue, I know you can't, but I, f for the listeners of this hearing, if in fact life is the presence of a heartbeat and brainwave, it's important for everybody in the country to know that at 16 days post-conception, a heartbeat is present. And that at 41 days, right now, we can assure ourselves that brain activity and brain waves are present. And as the technology improves, we're going to see that come earlier and earlier. I make that point because so many of the decisions of the Supreme Court have been made in a vacuum of the scientific knowledge of what life is, when personhood is, when it begins, when it doesn't, when it exists, when it doesn't. And, and it belies the scientific facts and medical facts that are out there today. And, and so that, that was for your information. Uh, and, and my ability to put forth a philosophy that I believe would solve a lot of the controversy in this country. Um, I want to cover one area uh, that was discussed yesterday um, uh, where the implication was made that, uh, that you might have ruled on a case uh, violating a judicial ethic, and, and that was the Hamden versus Rumsfeld case. Um, uh, Senator Feingold asked you questions about the case. You invoked the canon, the code of conduct of uh, U.S. judges that prohibits you from talking about a pending case. And I would like, uh, Mr. Chairman, a copy of that canon to be placed in the record. Uh, <coughs> Without objection, so ordered. And canon three provides that a judge should perform the duties of the office impartially and diligently. The judicial duties of a judge take precedence over all other activities in performing the duties prescribed by law the judge should adhere to the following standards and i'm uh, educative uh, adjudicative responsibilities there's another one of those legal words i'm having trouble getting my hands around a judge should avoid public comment on the merits of a pending or impending action requi requiring similar restraint by court personnel subject to the judge's direction and control the official commentary to Canon 3A6 provides the admonition against public comment about the merits of a pending or impending action until completion of the appellate process. I would also note that any criticism of your participation in this case is unwarranted. Numerous law professors who specialize in legal ethics have stated that you in no way have violated any ethics rules simply because you were considered for another judgeship. The opinion was finalized well before you uh, met with the president, I believe that's correct, or was, or was offered this nomination. Is that correct? Yes. 
The argument, the initial vote, and the drafting of the opinion all took place before this, there was a Supreme Court vacancy at all. Is that correct? Yes. Um, you did not write an opinion on that case. Is that correct? I joined uh, Judge you, Randolph's opinion. Right, but you did not write a separate opinion on no. that case. That's right. And I would like to also enter into the record the uh, nonpartisan ethics ethicists who agree that Judge Roberts did not violate any ethics rules. <clears throat> Without ethics. objection, it would made a part of the record. I want to go to one other area uh, that I have some concern about. Uh, uh, I know my concerns opposite from some of those uh, uh, who have a, a different philosophy of life, but many of the questions uh, posed to you have focused on our concerns about an activist judiciary. Uh, my opening statement expressed some of those concerns. Uh, however, I'm equally concerned about an activist Congress. Uh, that goes beyond its bounds, a, a, a Congress that routinely ignores its own constitutional boundaries. Historically, the debate about the role and scope of Congress has focused on the General Welfare Clause. Uh, as we all know, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 of the Constitution gives Congress the power to provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. The Tenth Amendment also spells out limitations on con congressional power. We had the discussion yesterday. Uh, on the toad, I believe. Uh, the Tenth Amendment states, the power not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. And I want to give you a quote that James Madison said, because in his wisdom he anticipated that we would try to stretch the definition of the founders. And, and he wrote, with respect to the words general welfare, I have always regarded them as qualified by the detail of powers connected with them. To take them in a literal and unlimited sense would be a metamorphosis of the Constitution into a character which there is a host of proofs was not contemplated by its creators. In Federalist Paper 45, Madison writes, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and infinite. Do you agree with James Madison's interpretation of the General Welfare Clause that the powers of the Congress should be fundamentally limited, or do you agree with the modern prevailing wisdom of both political parties, particularly appropriators, who believe Congress' role is fundamentally unlimited? Well, I agree with Madison's view uh, in general that the Constitution does contain limitations on the federal authority. That uh, the General Welfare Clause, and in particular the Necessary and Proper Clause, of course, have been interpreted uh, in many of Chief Justice John Marshall's early opinions uh, to recognize, though, that the scope of authority given to Congress is broad and broad enough to confront the problems that in Chief Justice John Marshall's case, were confronted by a young nation and helped to bind it together as a nation and broad enough today to confront the problems uh, that Congress addresses. But the notion that the Constitution was one of limited powers, uh, albeit broad under the Necessary and Proper Clause uh, and even the General Welfare Clause as interpreted by Chief Justice John Marshall in these early opinions, uh, doesn't uh, that recognition doesn't uh, undermine the framers' uh, essential vision uh, that we are dealing with a federal system in which vast powers reside with the states, and that the federal government is one of limited powers, broad in obviously particular areas and broad under the necessary and proper clause, but limited powers nonetheless. Thank you. Uh, I just have um, one other comment. Uh, as you have been before our committee. I, I've tried to use my medical skills of observation of body language to ascertain That's your uncomfortableness skill. and and and, <laughs> and uh, ill at ease with questions and responses. And, and uh, uh, I've honed that over about 23, 24 years. Okay. And uh, the other thing that I believe is integrity is at the basis of what we want in judges. And uh, I will tell you that I am very pleased, both in my observational capabilities as a physician, to know that your answers have been honest and forthright as I watch the rest of your body 
respond to the stress that you're under. But I'm also pleased with our president uh, that he's had the wisdom to pick somebody of such stature and such integrity. Uh, without integrity, what you say here means nothing. And that's the very foundation at which I believe you've based your life. And I'm pleased to have you before us. And I thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Senator Coburn. Uh, Judge Roberts, uh, before taking up the subject of the confrontation, we now proceed to the 20 minute round for each senator. Before taking up the uh, issue of the confrontation and clash between the Congress and the Supreme Court, I want to pick up a few strands from, uh, from yesterday's testimony. Uh, and near the end of my questioning, I had commented on the case of United States versus Dickerson, where the Chief Justice had made a modification of his earlier objections to Miranda and said that the Miranda warnings ought to be upheld, uh, contrasting his view in 1974 in a Supreme Court decision with his view in the year 2000, saying that Miranda should not be overruled because it has been embedded in routine police practices uh, and become a part of our national culture. And that has uh, all of the uh, earmarks of a doctrine of a living constitution. Uh, dissenting in Poe versus Ullman, Justice John Marshall Harlan made one of the famous statements on uh, this issue saying that the commenting on liberty, the quote, the traditions from which it is developed, quote, that tradition is a living thing. And my question to you is, do you regard the uh, evolution of, of various interpretations on liberty as a living thing as Justice Harlan did and as Justice Rehnquist appeared to on the Miranda issue? Well, I think the framers, when they use broad language um, like liberty, um, like uh, due process, uh, like unreasonable with respect to searches and seizures, they were crafting a document that they intended to apply in a meaningful way down the ages. As they said in the preamble, it was designed to secure the blessings of liberty for their posterity. They intended it to apply to, to changing conditions. And I think that in that sense, uh, uh, it, it is a concept that is alive in the sense that it applies, and they intended it to apply in a particular way, but they intended it to apply uh, down through the ages. Well, when you talk about intent, I think that's a pretty tough interpretation. When the Equal Protection Clause was passed by the Senate in 1868, the Senate galleries were segregated, blacks on one side and whites on the other. So that couldn't have been their uh, intent. And uh, uh, the interpretation, uh, which occurs later, uh, uh, really is uh, captured by uh, Justice Cardozo and the case of Palco versus Connecticut, a case which impressed me enormously back in the law school days when talking about uh, the constitutional evolution, referred to it as uh, expressing values which are, quote, the very essence of a scheme of ordered liberty, close quote, quote, principles of justice so rooted in the traditions and conscience of our people as to be ranked as fundamental. Uh, would you agree with uh, uh, the Cardozo statement of jurisprudence, which I just quoted? Well, the general approach of uh, recognizing the values that inform the interpretation of the Constitution, it applies to modern times. But just to take the example that you gave of the Equal Protection uh, Clause, the framers chose broad terms of broad applicability and they state a broad principle. And the fact that it may have been inconsistent with their practice uh, may have meant that they were adopting a broad principle that was inconsistent with their practice and their practices would have to change as they did with respect to segregation in the Senate galleries, with respect to segregation in other areas. But when they adopt broad terms and broad principles, we should hold them to their word and imply them consistent with those terms and those principles. And that means when they've adopted principles like liberty, uh, that doesn't get a 
crabbed or narrow construction. Uh, it is a broad principle that should be applied consistent with their intent, which was to adopt a broad principle. By, by, I, I depart from some views of original intent in the sense that those folks, uh, some people view it as meaning just the conditions at that time, just the particular problem. I think you need to, to look at the words they used, and if the words adopt a broader principle, it applies more broadly. Well, I'll accept that uh, as an indication of uh, your view not to have a, quote, crabbed interpretation uh, and applying the broad principles. Let me refer you to a statement by Chief Justice uh, Rehnquist in dissent in the Casey case, which uh, surprises me, and I ask you whether you agree with this. He said, quote, a woman's interest in having an abortion is a form of liberty protected by the due process clause. Do you agree with that? Well, uh, that does get into an area where cases are coming up. The chief in that position was referencing, of course, the holding in Roe versus Wade, and that was what the issue was in, in Casey. Um, but I don't think I should opine on the correctness or incorrectness of particular views in areas that uh, are likely to come before the court. I'm going to move now to the confrontation between Congress and the court and what I consider to be denigrating comments about uh, the Congress. Uh, in the Morrison case, uh, in the face of an overwhelming factual record, the court, five to four decision, said that uh, uh, parts of the legislation to protect women against violence unconstitutional. Uh, because of the congressional, quote, method of reasoning. And then the dissent uh, picked up the conclusion that uh, the majority's view was, quote, dependent upon a uniquely judicial competence, close quote, with the other side of the coin being uh, congressional uh, uh, incompetence. Uh, and then in uh, uh, the dissent in Tennessee versus Lane, uh, Justice Scalia uh, says that uh, the court engages in ill-advised uh, proceedings to make itself the, quote, taskmaster uh, to see if the Congress has, uh, has done its uh, homework. Uh, you commented a few minutes ago that you would be respectful uh, of Congress. Uh, uh, do we have your commitment that... Uh, uh, you won't uh, characterize your method of reasoning as superior to ours? I, I don't think it's appropriate. Now, in, in your particular case, maybe yours is, but no, as, no. A, uh, as, a, um, and as I, a generalization, <laughs> as a generalization, uh, we've, we've gone around this with other nominees, and after they've gone to the court, they haven't been mindful as to what they have said here, but... Uh, I, I take umbrage at what uh, uh, the court has said, and so do my, uh, so do my colleagues. Uh, uh, there isn't a method of reasoning which changes when you move across the green uh, from the Senate uh, columns to the Supreme Court columns. And uh, we do our homework, evidenced by what uh, has gone on in this hearing. And we don't like uh, being treated as school children, uh, requiring, as uh, Justice Scalia says, uh, a taskmaster. Uh, will you do better on this subject, uh, Judge Roberts? Well, I don't think the court should be a uh, taskmaster of Congress. I think uh, uh, the Constitution is the court's taskmaster, and it's Congress's taskmaster as well. And we each have responsibilities under the Constitution. Um, and I appreciate very much the differences in uh, institutional competence between the judiciary and the Congress when it comes to the basic questions of fact-finding, uh, development of a record, and also the authority to make the policy decisions about how to act on the basis of a particular record. It's not just disagreement over a record. It's a question of whose job it is to make a determination based on the record. Now, the record on the record, in uh, uh, U.S. versus Morrison, uh, the legislation to protect women against violence, uh, the uh, record showed uh, that there were uh, 
uh, reports on gender bias from the task force in 21 states and eight separate reports issued by Congress and its committees over a long course of time leading to the enactment and the characterization uh, by the dissenters that there was a, a mountain uh, of evidence. Uh, what, what, more, what more does the Congress have to do uh, to establish a record uh, that will be respected by the, the court. And this is where uh, the five-person majority threw it over, uh, not because of the record, but because of the method of reasoning. Isn't that record palpably sufficient to sustain the constitutionality of the act? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to comment on the correctness or incorrectness of a particular decision. What I will say... Well, Judge Roberts, let me interrupt you there for a minute. Uh, uh, wh wh why not? The case is over. This isn't a case which is likely uh, to come before you again. These are the uh, specific facts uh, uh, based on the uh, rape of the woman, alleged rape by the three VMI students. Uh, I, I, I liked your answers yesterday. You were willing to answer more questions about cases uh, on the uh, differentiation that they are not likely to come before the court. This is not uh, likely to come before the court again. Isn't this record sufficient in Morrison to well, Mr. Chairman, hold the act? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I must respectfully disagree. I have been willing to comment on cases that I think are not likely to come before the court again. I think the particular question you ask about the adequacy of findings to make a determination of the impact on interstate commerce uh, is likely to come before the court again. And expressing an opinion on whether the Morrison case was correct or, or incorrect uh, would be prejudging those cases that are likely to come before the court uh, uh, again. And that is the line. It's not just a line that I'm drawing. It's a line that, as I've read the transcripts, every nominee who's sitting on the court today drew. Some of them drew the line far more aggressively and wouldn't even comment on cases like Marbury versus, Morris, uh, Marbury versus Madison. Um, what I can tell you is that with respect to review of congressional findings, that my view of the appropriate role of a judge is a limited role and that you do not make the law and that it seems to me that one of the <coughs> warning flags that should suggest to you as a judge that you may be beginning to transgress into the area of making the law is when you are in a position of reevaluating uh, legislative findings because that doesn't look like uh, a judicial function. It's not an application of analysis under the Constitution. It's, a, it's just another look at findings. Now, again, I don't feel it's appropriate to comment on Morrison. I do feel it's appropriate to tell you that I appreciate the differences between Congress and the courts with respect to findings, both with respect to the issue of the capability and competence to undertake that enterprise and also with respect to the issue of authority to make a decision based on the findings. Judge uh, Roberts will have to agree to disagree about that. Uh, I don't think the facts of Morrison are likely to come before the court, but uh, uh, I ask the questions, uh, you answer them. Let me come now to uh, uh, the Americans for Disabilities Act. Uh, and you have uh, uh, five to four decisions going opposite ways. Uh, Ms. Garrett uh, had breast cancer. Uh, the court in 2001 said that uh, uh, the uh, title of the Disabilities Act was unconstitutional, five to four, uh, on employment discrimination. Uh, then uh, three years later, uh, you have the case uh, coming up uh, of Lane, paraplegia, crawling up the steps, accommodations, five to four. Uh, the act is upheld. Uh, the uh, record in the case it was very extensive, 13 congressional hearings, a task force that held hearings in every state, attended by more than 30,000 people, including thousands who had experienced discrimination. And uh, in the Garrett case, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, used a doctrine which uh, had been uh, uh, in vogue only since 1997 in the Bernie case. Uh, you and I discussed this uh, uh, in my office. So they came up with a standard of what is uh, congruent and proportionate. Congruence and proportionality. 
Uh, I was interested in your statement when we talked informally that you didn't find those in the 14th Amendment. I didn't either. Now, they plucked congruence and proportionality right out of thin air. Uh, uh, and uh, when Scalia dissented, uh, uh, he said that the congruence and proportionality test was a quote, flabby test, which is a, quote, invitation to judicial arbitrariness by policy-driven decision-making. Now, you said yesterday that you did not think that there was judicial activism when the court overruled an act of Congress. Uh, isn't this congruence and proportionality test, which comes out of thin air, uh, a classic example of judicial activism where the view of congruence, uh, hard to find a definition for congruence. Proportionality, hard to find a definition for proportionality. I've searched and can't find any. Isn't that the very essence of uh, what is in the eye of the beholder, where the court takes carte blanche to declare acts of Congress unconstitutional? Well. These questions arise, of course, under, as you know, Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, where the issue is Congress's power to uh, uh, address violations of the 14th Amendment. And it's an extraordinary grant of, of power, and the Court has always recognized it as such. And their decisions in recent years, it's not just, as you point out, the Garrett case on the one hand and the <coughs> Lane case on the others. There are, you have the Hibbs case recently, which upheld Congress's exercise of authority. The most recent cases, Lane uh, and Hibbs, uh, uphold Congress's exercise of authority to abrogate. But Judge Robert, they uphold it at the pleasure of the court. Well, Congress, uh, Congress can't figure, figure that out. There's no way we can tell what's congruent and proportional in the eyes of the court. Well, and that was Justice Scalia's. Uh, position in dissent. He had originally... Do you agree with Scalia? Well, I, again, this the congruent and proportional test... Do you disagree with Justice Scalia? Uh, I don't think it's appropriate in an area... And there are <laughs> cases coming up, as you know, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a case on the docket right now that considers the congruence and proportionality test. That's why I'm um, raising it with you. I'd like to see a sensible interpretation with the court in that case. Well, and if I am confirmed, and I do have to sit on that case, um, I would approach that with an open mind and consider the arguments. I can't give you a commitment here today about how I will approach an issue that is going to be on the docket within a matter of months. Judge Roberts, I'm not talking about an issue. I'm talking about the es essence of jurisprudence. I'm talking about the essence of a man-woman-made test in the Supreme Court which has no grounding in the Constitution, no grounding in the Federalist Papers, no grounding in the history of the country, comes out of thin air in 1997, and it's used in uh, Lane and Garrett uh, to uh, two five to four decisions on identical records, on an identical act, and uh, the country and the Congress are supposed to figure out what, what the court means. So I'm really talking about jurisprudence. Judge Roberts, let me move to one other subject in the two minutes that I have remaining. Uh, and that is uh, on the uh, ability which you uh, would have, if confirmed as Chief Justice, to try to bring a consensus to the court. Uh, we have five to four decisions as the hallmark of the courts, not unusual. You commented yesterday about what Chief Justice Warren did uh, on Brown versus Board of Education, taking a very disparate court and pulling the court together. Uh, as you and I discussed in my office, there are an overwhelming number of cases where uh, there are multiple concurrences. Uh, a writes a concurring opinion in which B joins, then B writes a concurring opinion in which A joins and C joins. Uh, in reading uh, the uh, trilogy of cases on detainees from June of uh, 2004 to figure out what we ought to do about Guantanamo, it was a patchwork of confusion. Uh, I was intrigued by uh, the comment which you made in our uh, in our meeting about uh, uh, a dialogue uh, among equals. Uh, 
uh, and you characterize that as a dialogue among equals when you appear before the court and uh, uh, they're on a little different uh, level over there. Uh, uh, I, I'm way behind you on Supreme Court arguments. It's 39 to 3, but uh, I would have been an equal of theirs in any event. Perhaps you are, but I am intrigued by your concept, and I asked you how you'd be able to be the chief with uh, Justice Scalia, who is 18 years older than you, and even Justice uh, Thomas, who's uh, uh, seven years older than you. Uh, tell us what you think you can do on this uh, dialogue among equals to try to bring some consensus to the court, to try to avoid these proliferation of opinions and uh, avoid all these five to four decisions. Time's well, up. <laughs> well, I'd like to hear the answer because that's the question I was going to ask too. So, well, now we're on Senator Leahy's time. No, no, time. no we're Go not ahead. on my time. <laughs> we're not on my time. We're still on yours, Mr. Chairman. But I'd like to, I'd like to hear uh, the answer. It's permissible to have the answer on the red light, just Sorry. not the question. <laughs> Um, well, I don't want to be presumptuous um, uh, about if I am confirmed um, what I would do. I do think, though, it's a responsibility of all of the justices, not just the Chief Justice, to try to work toward an opinion of the court. Uh, the, the Supreme Court speaks only as a court. Individually, the justices have no authority. Um, and I do think it should be a priority uh, to have an opinion of the court. Uh, you don't obviously compromise strongly held views, but you do have to be open to the considered views of your colleagues, particularly when it gets to a concurring opinion. I do think you do need to ask yourself, what benefit is this serving? Uh, why is it necessary for me to state this separate reason? Can I go take another look at what the four of them think or the three of them think to see if I can <coughs> subscribe to that or get them to modify it in a way that would allow me to subscribe to that because an important function of the Supreme Court is to provide guidance. As a lower court judge, uh, I appreciate clear guidance from the Supreme Court. I know I think the last thing the uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist said in court uh, on the last day of the term, he was reading the disposition in a case and said, you know, a re, uh, reaches this conclusion, he's joined by B, and then C has a separate concurrence, joined by D and E, and he ended up by saying, I didn't know we had that many judges on the court. Um, and that undermines the importance of providing guidance. I do think the Chief Justice has a particular obligation to try to achieve uh, consensus consistent with everyone's individual oath to uh, uphold the Constitution, and that would certainly be a priority for me if I were confirmed. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Jack Roberts. You, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Leahy. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for asking that question. I, it was one I wanted to ask, too. Last night, we welcomed you to night court. Uh, welcome to daytime court. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it will probably become night court before we get done. <laughs> we, uh, we talked just briefly about the First Amendment yesterday, and it's written primarily in terms of speech, but uh, in a free and democratic uh, nation, uh, uh, access to information, I think, is is extraordinarily important too. Our framers do the maximum maximum knowledge is power. Actually, that was the maximum the uh, administration used as the model for what was a somewhat Orwellian uh, total information awareness program until a Republican Congress, uh, and I supported this, shut it down, as asking too much knowledge about individual Americans. I also spoke about we the people. If we the people know what our government's doing and why it's doing it, we can hold the government accountable and should. So I, I worry about administration. I'm not going into a specific case, but I'm worried about administration that spreads misinformation, that is uh, declaring more things secret and spending billions of dollars doing that far more than any administration in history, probably all administrations put together. It punishes the uh, uh, whistleblowers that bars the press and cameras from so many different events. So I, and I believe very strongly that if the people want to know what's going on, the courts are if at all possible, supposed to take their sides in making sure they know what's going on. Because a government should not be able to hide things unnecessarily to the people. No matter who's in power, the people should know what's going on. 
So I, I, I'd like to know how you would approach such a case. Let me give you a few examples. In the last couple of years, the administration fought to prevent the media from covering coffins returning from Iraq. It fought to keep disturbing I images of U.S. Uh, run prisons in Iraq from the media. And uh, just last weekend, actually after it lost the initial bout in court, it abandoned its zero access policy regarding the scenes of, access, uh, of devastation in New Orleans. And as you know, most of America found out what was going on in New Orleans really from the press, not from our government, at least the first few days. There's been a number of uh, reasons, excuses, which seem to change day by day for why these things are being blocked. I'm not going to ask you to evaluate them. But my question is this. If the government seeks to exclude, broadly excuse, media from access to images or events of public interests or concern, does the First Amendment require the government to justify that denial of access? And if so, what kind of standards? Well, in particular case, but what kind of standards does the court have to apply? Uh, Senator, I haven't dealt with a lot of First Amendment access cases. Um, I know I, I studied one about media access to prisons, for example, the issue about uh, whether the media had a right of access to prisons, they wanted to report on it. Um, and so I'm not terribly familiar with the, the precise levels of scrutiny that apply. Uh, there is uh, obviously a balancing of sorts between particular interests when you're dealing with governmental operations and there's some perfectly valid reasons for excluding uh, media. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, it's simply uh, disagreement about whether it's an appropriate issue for the public to see would not strike me as a very compelling governmental interest. And I think the courts regularly balance these sorts of things uh, when they get an issue about uh, uh, a challenge by the media saying their First Amendment rights are being violated because of a particular exclusion. And under Again, I'm not terribly familiar with the precise legal standards uh, uh, or how they've developed since the, the, the prison access case that I'm familiar with. But it does require a consideration and weighing, and, and the values of the uh, First Amendment obviously are something that have to be given careful weight uh, by the court for the very reasons that you've discussed, because the First Amendment is, uh, it serves a purpose. It's not there just because the, the, the framers thought this was in general a good idea. It serves a purpose with respect to the government. It provides access to information and allows people in a free society to make a judgment about what their government is up to. But, but let me, uh, like the chairman, I was a prosecutor, and, and if I move a little bit out of the prison situation which raises all other kinds of, of, of questions and, and uh, per, uh, abilities to limit access. Let's just go to something that the public might easily have access to if they could just walk in there. Uh, suppose a government, I'll use something like Katrina, uh, suppose they felt that the rescue operations of the government, whether it's state, local, or federal, was, go was being handled in an inept way, or evacuees were being mistreated, does that give them a right to bar the media who may want to expose that? Well, I think it's a general... And how would you how would you analyze the claim uh, without deciding a particular case? How would you analyze the The, the media comes and says, look, the, um, the government screwed up. Uh, we're trying to get in there and take pictures to show how they screwed up and they say you can't come in. How would you analyze a claim like that? Well, uh, you know, I do start with a general principle in this area, and I, I, I think it was Justice Brandeis who talked about, you know, sunlight being the best disinfectant. And um, I think that's a lot of what the framers had in mind uh, in guaranteeing uh, freedom of speech and the other rights that go along with it. They appreciated the benefits that would come from public awareness. That's an important principle. I also, uh, and again, um, this is not an area that I feel completely up to speed on the precedents, and I obviously, if I were in a position as a judge and had to decide a particular case, uh, would uh, study them and become aware. But my recollection is that there is uh, 
great difficulty whenever you try to distinguish between public rights and media rights, and that if it's a situation in which the public is being given access, you can't discriminate against the media and say, uh, uh, as a general matter, that the media don't have access, because their, ac their access rights, of course, uh, correspond with those of the, uh, the public. And as you said, they're in a position uh, just be if there are a handful of people who might be able to have access, uh, the media is in a position to make that uh, information or knowledge or whatever available on a broader basis. Um, and I, I, I raise this because, and I'm not trying to pin you on a particular case, I, I think we're going to see more and more of this. We're in a digital age, a lot of information readily available. At the same time, the, the bad part about that is our government can acquire more and more and more information on us, just as your credit card company or anybody else does on you. And some of us want to be in a position to be able to go in and find out what is being collected on us. Uh, to what extent are we giving up our privacy? And usually, far more than the Congress or anybody else, it's been the media that's exposed when this has been overdone, when uh, mistakes or violations are done. And I would hope that you would be committed, uh, you would be committed to protecting just as much as possible uh, access rather than, rather than the other way around. Let me, um, let me go to an issue we discussed yesterday or others did, on the issue of capital punishment. We've held in this committee a number of hearings that show some real flaws in the, in the administration of capital punishment. You know, sleeping lawyers, drunk lawyers, lawyers didn't bother even uh, to investigate or didn't have the funds to do it. More than 100 uh, death row inmates have been exonerated. Some, though, who have spent years on death row in the most horrible conditions for a crime they never committed. Uh, I think Senator Durbin mentioned uh, the situation out in Illinois where the Republican governor had to and did courageously about... Um, uh, send clemency to a whole lot of people who had been on death row. Some say, and I think you've even said this, when they're exonerated it shows the system works. Well, let me tell you about the system in that case. One of the people is Anthony Porter. Spent 16 years on death row. He was within two days of being executed. The system didn't work on behalf of the government doing it. A bunch of kids from Northwestern University who had taken as an elective course, a course on journalism, and the teacher said, why don't you look into a couple of these? And these kids went out and did it. The kids dug up the information that was there, available to the police, available to the prosecutor, available to the defense. Nobody dug up. They found it. And within two days of his uh, execution, the state's attorney dropped the case. They got somebody else to confess. Um, you said two years ago, and I remember being at that hearing, you said that on the startling number of innocent men sentenced to death who were later exonerated, you responded somehow showed the system worked in exonerating them. I worry about that statement. I, I really do. It, it's bothered me. You know, I voted for you for, for the uh, circuit court, and there was a split vote in our party. But that one really bothered me, that statement. I, I, I found it almost mechanical. And, I, and I'll tell you why. When we have people say innocent people have been freed after years on death row shows the system is working, it doesn't. I think Senator Dale O'Connor said um, a few years ago, if statistics are any indication the system may well be allowing some innocent defendants to be executed. If that's the case, the system is not working. In Harara, we discussed that, the, the court grappled with, did not, uh, didn't ultimately decide, uh, does the Constitution permit the execution of a person who is um, uh, innocent? And as Principal Deputy Solicitor General, you co-authored the amicus brief for the U.S. in, uh, in the Harara case. You said that a claim of actual innocence does not state a ground for federal habeas. Actually, you said, quote, does the Constitution require the prisoner have the right to seek judicial review of a claim of newly discovered evidence instead of being required to seek relief in the clemency process? 
In our view, the Constitution does not guarantee the prisoner such a right. So let me ask you this, without going to the facts of our is it your current personal view the death row inmate who can prove his innocence has no constitutional right to do so before a court, before he's executed? Uh, well, Senator, and this is the basis of the disagreement in Herrera. Herrera is not a case about actual innocence. Well, it's a question of whether you're entitled to bring a new claim. But listen to my, listen to my question. Does a death row inmate who can prove his innocence, do they have no constitutional right to do so in a court of law before they're executed? Well, prove his, his innocence. The issue arises before you get to the question of proof. And the question is, do you allow someone who has raised several claims over the years to suddenly say at the last minute, somebody who just died was the person who uh, committed the murder? And does that mean you start the trial all over again simply on the basis of that last minute claim? Or do you require more of a showing at that stage? That's what Herrera was about. Now, I don't think, of course, that anybody who is innocent should be uh, uh, suffer uh, for, as a result of a false conviction. If they've been falsely convicted and they're innocent, they shouldn't be well, does uh, the, in, does in the prison, let alone executed. But does the, the Constitution issue, permit the execution of innocent person? I, I would think not, but the question is never do you allow the execution of an innocent person. The question is do you allow particular claimants to raise different claims fourth or fifth or sixth time uh, to say at the last minute uh, somebody who just died was actually the person who committed the murder, let's have a new trial? Uh, or do you uh, uh, take into account the proceedings that have already uh, gone on? I'm looking on? for broad principles here. You said, let me read it again, does the Constitution require that a prisoner have the right to seek judicial review of a claim of newly discovered evidence instead of being required to seek relief in the clemency process? In our view, the Constitution does not guarantee the prisoner such a right. Is that your view today? Well, that's what the court held in Herrera. And and is that your view today? Well, I'm not in a position to comment on the correctness or incorrectness of particular court decisions. That's the court's precedent in Herrera. It agreed with the administration position, which was not that innocent people should be subject to imprisonment or execution. That's the position you took. Supreme Court is going to revisit this issue in House versus Bell uh, because you stated a position on that. Does that require you to recuse yourself in, in a House versus Bell? No, because the position was stated in my a brief filed on behalf of the administration. Uh, and we've talked yesterday about the established principle that lawyers do not subscribe as a personal matter to the views they present on behalf of clients. Well, in this case, the clients, the United States, I mean, you're stating the position as sort of the, um, uh, what do they call it, the tenth, um, the tenth justice? Well, I was the deputy solicitor general on the brief. I didn't argue the case. The solicitor general uh, was the counsel of record in the case. Um, but the position presented in the brief as an advocate is not necessarily the position of every lawyer on the brief. Um, I think you were more than just a lawyer in the brief. You were one of the most sought-after jobs picked because of your position. Um, I was very impressed when I talked with you about your your use of Latin, for example, uh, in what in French, and um, I'm always impressed with that facility. There is a Latin phrase, and this is not a gotcha. I'll I'll, I'll translate it. Qui uh, facie per alium facie per se, he who acts for another acts for himself, and um, that's not the case in Herrera. He who acts for another acts for himself. Well, it's the client acting through the lawyer, and it's the client who's acting for themselves. You are the, you are the client in this case when you're the solicitor general is the client in a, in effect. Uh, no, uh, Senator, I disagree with that. Okay. The Solicitor General represents the interests of the United States, and th those positions uh, represent uh, that client's position. And in, me, this, in the Herrera case, again, it was the Solicitor General who was responsible for the position that was, that was advanced. I'm not suggesting in any way that I disagree with it or agree with it. I'm just saying that it is a basic principle in our system that lawyers represent clients, and you do not ascribe the position of the client uh, 
to the lawyer. It's a position that goes back to John Adams and the revolution. Let me ask you, let me ask you this then. Let me ask you something that can be ascribed to justice of the Supreme Court. It's something that uh, both the chairman and I have talked a lot about. Uh, and that goes into some of the mechanics. And if you let me take a moment, you understand these, but for the audience, the so-called uh, rule of four. It, um, it takes only four justices to grant cert, but it takes five to uh, grant a stay of execution. Usually the courtesy is that if you get four, a fifth one will sign on. That um, has not always been followed of late. Of course, we're dealing with we're dealing with with the uh, life life or death issue. Senator Specter called it uh, bizarre and unacceptable, and considered legislation to change it. How do you feel if you were chief? You have four four of the justices have now vote for a stay of execution. Do you feel as chief you should do the courtesy of the rule of five and kick in the fifth one? It's an issue that I'm familiar with. I do know it arose, and I thought the common practice, I, uh, the current practice, was that if there are four votes to grant cert, that the court would grant the stay, even though that does require the fifth vote, so that you don't have a situation. It's usually a courtesy. Yeah, but that's because one more says, okay, we got four. Right. Uh, we'll put somebody else's name on it, but that hasn't been followed uh, all the time recently. It, it usually was, mm. and that's why both Senator Specter and I have raised concern. Do you feel the earlier practice of once you have four, I, I put think the fifth? I think that practice makes a lot of sense. I don't want to commit uh, to pursue a particular practice in an area that we'll, I'll obviously have to look at in the future, but it obviously makes great sense that if you have four to grant, and that's the rule that you will consider an issue if there are four to grant, you don't want to moot the case by not staying uh, uh, the sentence. And I, I appreciate that because I know we um, find a lot of cases where they're perfectly willing to grant cert on monetary damages, but uh, here it's, you kind of get it right. Uh, it doesn't make much difference for an appeal after, after the execution. You wrote a memo regarding, back in 83, as a White House lawyer, you wrote a memo regarding proposals by then Chief Justice Warren Berger to reduce the Supreme Court's caseload. In that memo, you volunteered the following. If the justices truly think they're overworked, the cure lies close at hand. For example, giving coherence to Fourth Amendment jurisprudence by adopting the good faith standard and advocating the, rule, the role of fourth or fifth guesser in death penalty cases would eliminate about a half dozen argued cases from the court's docket each term. Are you saying that judges are just too busy to pay attention to death cases? No, uh, no, Senator. But what I, are you I'm saying? Not. How do you feel today? That was 83. How do you feel now, 20, 22 years later? Well, in 83, of course, they were hearing about 150 cases a year. Uh, they hear about half that now. Um, again, I don't want to prejudge questions uh, or even be presumptuous to look down the road, but it seems to me that there's the capability there to hear more cases today, um, not fewer. Um, and. I'm sure there are reasons for the reduction in the caseload that I'm not familiar with that I might become more familiar with, but they handled twice as many cases 20 years ago than they do today, and I think the capability to address more issues is, is there in the court. My time is up, but I think you'll find both the chairman and ranking member of, the, of, of this committee believe they, they could handle more. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Thank, you, Thank Senator. you, Senator Leahy. Senator Hatch? Oh. <clears throat> I think you've really acquitted yourself as well as anybody I've seen in the ten uh, nomination for the nominations for the Supreme Court that I've uh, been part of. Uh, and I just have to, I want to correct the record a little bit. It isn't the Ginsburg rule, although that's been referred to by almost all of us, including me. It's the Thurgood Marshall rule, the Rehnquist rule, the Kennedy, Souter, Thomas, Ginsburg, Breyer, just to name a few rule, because in every case, as I stated in my original remarks, the individual nominee has to draw a line as to what they can discuss and what they can't. And you've drawn, I think, a fair line here throughout these proceedings, and I commend you for it. Uh, 
and uh, and uh, there's just no excuse for being pushed to try and answer questions about cases that are likely to come before the court or presently are before the court. And I think I think the American people are starting to really fully realize that now as a result of these hearings. Now, Judge Roberts, as you know, the war on terror is a unique challenge in American history. As a consequence, many novel issues regarding uh, presidential authority to prosecute the war on terror will, will doubtless come before the Supreme Court. I think we all recognize the need to be careful in our questioning so you're not placed in the position of pre-committing yourself to any particular viewpoints on executive power that would compromise your ability to render a fair judgment as cases come before the court. But let me ask you a general question on terrorism. It is a question that many in Congress and the administration and in the public have had to struggle with, particularly in the aftermath of the events of September 11, 2001. The question is this, what is the best way for our society to protect ourselves against terrorists not affiliated with a nation state where no uniforms and, and uh, really uh, secrete themselves in ways that have never been done before? On, on the one hand, there are very specific international rules embodied in the Geneva Conventions that specify how enemies captured during traditional warfare are to be treated. On the other hand, we have the traditional uh, criminal law protections contained in Title 18 of the United States Code that define the rights uh, accorded to criminals such as the famous Miranda warnings, uh, warning, I should say, and the right uh, to obtain counsel. What everyone is struggling with is how do we apply these two traditional methods against non-traditional enemies uh, who clearly are non-traditional. Let us make no mistake, uh, their goal is to destroy our society and way of life. And they will use weapons of mass destruction if they can. I don't think anybody doubts that. Let me just ask you this general question. Will you give us assurance that you will keep an open mind as the administration and Congress adopt and implement new policies and legal procedures that govern the apprehension, interrogation, and detention of suspected terrorists? Uh, y yes, Senator, I will. Um, I certainly am not qualified to comment on the best approaches uh, in the war on terror or the most effective approaches. Um, that is the responsibility, obviously, of the other branches. The responsibility of the judicial branch is to decide particular cases that are presented to them in this area according to the rule of law. Um, and that is what uh, I have tried to do, and that is what I will continue to do either on the Court of Appeals or another court. Well, thank you. Now, also yesterday, the Democrat staff of the committee released a press release stating that you failed uh, to distance yourself from what it called your earlier cramped positions on Title IX and women's rights. And after listening to you yesterday, I, I did not find your earlier positions cramped at all. In fact, as you explained here to the committee, Many of the documents that questioners relied upon reflected the positions of the Reagan administration for which you worked. Now, what assurance can you give the committee that you will fairly interpret the civil rights laws, including critical statutes such as Title IX, uh, fully and fairly, consistent with the purposes Congress intended in passing these laws? Well, I can give the commitment that I appreciate that my role as a judge is different than my role as a staff lawyer for an, ad an administration. Um, as a judge, uh, I have no agenda. Uh, I have a guide in the Constitution and the laws uh, and the precedents of the court, and those are what I would apply with an open mind after fully and fairly considering the arguments and assessing the considered views of my colleagues on the bench. That's the way I would approach cases in that area as in any other area. The approach of someone who's obviously a, a staff lawyer in the administration is very different. The approach of someone who's an advocate for a client before the court is obviously very different. Those are positions that I have held in the past. I am now a judge and I have had the experience and I think my record will establish that that is how I approach cases across the spectrum of issues that are raised before the courts. And reasonable people can differ on some of these issues. Issues. Oh, certainly. Now, in the Grove City case, you won that case, didn't you? The administration's position prevailed before That's the right. court. That's yes. right. In other words, the position that you had advocated prevailed. Then, we didn't like it up here on Capitol Hill. So we passed the, uh, the Civil Rights uh, Restoration Act, and we changed it, right? Yes, which, you know. of course, is always the prerogative of Congress when you're dealing with a question of statutory interpretation, and that's part of a regular... Uh, interchange between the court and the Congress. Sometimes 
If the court gets something wrong, Congress can fix it. Even if the court gets it right, but Congress thinks the, uh, the approach ought to be changed, Congress is free to legislate uh, to, for a different result. So I find it strange to criticize you because you won a case in the Supreme Court and have not advocated uh, against uh, women's rights in any way, shape, or form ever in your uh, career, as far as I can understand. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. And, in fact, you are a strong supporter of women's rights and gender equality. Yes, Senator. Okay. Now, l let me just ask you a question that relates to some of the answers you gave yesterday g regarding the voting rights. Even as the hearing was unfolded, again, uh, Democratic staffers um, uh, of the committee issued a press release that said that you had missed an opportunity to distance yourself from what the release called your earlier narrow positions on the reach of the Voting Rights Act. Now that is not what I heard you say, nor do I believe that is what the public heard. The Democratic press release said that you had resorted to vague generalities about the importance of voting. Now as I heard you, I heard you explain the vigorous debate that took place regarding reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in the 1980s. And by the way, I was part of that debate. I felt very deeply that the, that the effects test should apply to Section 5 to those states that had a history of discrimination. But I also felt very deeply at the time that the intent test should apply to all the other states in Section 2, which was the position I think the administration took that you had to do some research on and, and uh, uh, within the administration. Now, I lost in committee. Now, I was arguing that all of the states that did not have a history of, of, uh, of discrimination should not have be burdened by the effects test, which basically says if the effects of what happens looks like discrimination, it therefore is, even if there was never an intent to commit discrimination. Now, I lost, but I feel that the Voting Rights Act is the most important civil rights bill in history, and I felt it then. And I voted for the amended bill with the effects test language in Section 2 and have been a strong supporter ever since. Would that be fair to describe your feelings about that? Well, yes, Senator. The, the debate, as you remember, was over whether or not the Section 2 should be extended without change uh, as interpreted by the Supreme Court in Mobile against uh, Bolden or whether it should be changed uh, to incorporate the effects test and later the totality of the circumstances test. The administration position at the time was to extend the Voting Rights Act for the longest period in history without change. Um, and that was the position that I was working on at the time. Uh, uh, and Congress eventually decided with uh, Senator Dole and some of the other senators uh, developed a compromise position on Section 2 and that was enacted with the support of the administration. And the one thing that was clear to me throughout those extended debates uh, uh, was that the people on both sides of the issue uh, in good faith supported uh, extension of the Voting Rights Act and recognized the importance of the Voting Rights Act in securing civil liberties for all Americans. It wasn't a dispute about the goal. It wasn't a dispute about the objective. It wasn't a dispute about the importance. It was a dispute about whether to extend the act without change or whether to make changes in the act. And that was what the debate was about. Well, and the difference was is that uh, the administration vo vehemently wanted to pass the Voting Rights Act as it existed that was somewhat difficult to pass originally uh, when, it, when, when it was originally passed. And that was, a, that was a decent, honorable position. But when it was changed uh, through our democratic process up here on Capitol Hill, uh, I felt for the worst at the time, but I feel like I was wrong at the time, uh, then we, we voted for it. In fact, it was my friend, uh, Senator Kennedy, who uh, insisted that I come down to the White House as part of the... Uh, bill signing team because he knew how deeply I felt about this. But there was a legitimate reason to take the administration's position and the administration, uh, once the compromise was reached with uh, Senators Doe and Kennedy, the administration accepted that as well and so did you. That, that was the point I just kind of wanted to make because I think it's important to realize that, uh, that we can sometimes, uh, you know, we can sometimes uh, get to a point where we misconstrue the intentions of decent, honorable people. And I count myself one of those. And even though uh, I lost in committee, I voted for this bill.
is to me, it is the most important civil rights bill in history, albeit others are very important as well. Now, I just uh, want to tell you that, like I say, I've been here for 29 years and I've been through 10 of these. I think 10, if I recall correctly. And in all of that time, we've seen some really sterling, brilliant, wonderful people before this committee, but I've never seen anybody who has done a better job of explaining himself than you have. If people can't vote for you, then I doubt that they can vote for any Republican nominee. You have made a very, very uh, strong presentation here. And I hope the American people realize that, and I hope uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle realize that, and uh, I look forward to seeing you as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court and do everything in my power to see that you, you are confirmed. With that, I have eight and a half minutes left. I reserve the balance of my time. <clears throat> thank you very much, Senator Hatch. Uh, Senator Kennedy? Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Senator. I'd like to, uh, if we could, come back in the time that I have now and uh, perhaps in a follow-up round to the uh, issue on, on civil rights because, as been mentioned here by, by others, it is the uh, overarching issue, I think, uh, for our country and our society. I think our founders didn't get it right at the time of the drafting of the Constitution. We've had a civil war. This country went through an extraordinary period of time uh, led by Dr. King in the uh, 1950s and then we had that extraordinary moment of Dr. King uh, here at the Lincoln Memorial which I think touched the conscience of the nation, people from all over the country. We were stuck for months on the 1964 Act as you probably remember and then with the action that was taken uh, by uh, Everett Dirks and it opened up the possibilities for reaching a compromise on the public accommodation provisions. We spent eight hours, a number of us in the Judiciary Committee with Nick Katzenbach over in the Capitol office and had an agreement at that time there'd be no amendments on the public accommodations. We could amend other uh, provisions and the legislation went forward and was monumental in its importance and consequence. The then we came back and realized after that that the most important legislation that we could probably address, we still had a ways to go on, on housing and employment, but although employment was included in the 64 Act, but not to a great extent, was in the Voting Rights Act. And we had extensive hearings. And uh, during the, uh, the course of those hearings, uh, by this uh, committee, other committees as well, we listened to the Attorney General Katzenbach, who had been working with Senator Dirksen, really the architect, leadership of President Johnson certainly, but the architect of the 64 Act. And he testified before this committee about the Section 2 provisions. And in his uh, testimony on the Section 2 provisions, uh, he said Section 2 applies to any voting practice or procedure if its purpose or effect was to deny or bridge the right to vote on account of race or color. So for many of us, including the civil rights community, believed that the effects test was operative at that time. That bill passed the House by 333 to 85, 77 to 19. The next thing that happened is we had the series of tests, as you recall, and the overarching test case was the Zimmer case, but we have a number of other cases, Zimmer versus McKithen, and it was the Fifth Circuit in bank, Fifth Circuit that uh, dealt with the whole range, for the most part, range of uh, states where many of these challenges had existed, although uh, I certainly recognize we have a long ways to go in my own state of Massachusetts. But uh, this was this court in bank, effectively in the Zimmer case, it was the lead case on the effects test. <laughs> and that was followed by a series of cases, U.S. versus Post, Kendrick versus Walder, for a long period of time. You're, you're aware of this history? 
I, I'm remembering it from when we addressed this debate okay. 23 years ago. Right. Yes. But it sounds familiar. Um, then we went up to 1980 and we had the Mobile case, which effectively put the intent test in. And after the Mobile case, as you well remember, the Justice Department dropped a whole series of cases that had been prepared under the effects test because they did not believe that they could make the case on the intent test. Whole series. And this sent a very powerful message to individuals across the, uh, the South, other parts of the country, that the additional kind of a burden to demonstrate intention was going to be so substantial it was going to make uh, in terms of resources and to try and determine the intent of individuals that lived many years ago to virtually be prohibitive. That happened. The Justice Department dropped scores, scores of cases. And it was one of the important reasons that the civil rights community and many of us believed that it was so important at the time of the extension of the voting rights case in 1982 that we put the effects test in. You believed, as I remember, and as we've gone over, uh, that it should have been a restatement of the existing law, as you correctly stated yesterday, which was the intent test. Am, am I that correct was the, so far? That was the administration Administration's position. position. I remember French Smith testifying before this committee to that effect, I remember at, at that particular time. Every civil rights group in 1982 uh, included the effects test. This is the NAACP, Legal Defense, National Urban League, Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights under Law, Conference on Civil Rights, Mexican American Legal, National Council of Raza, League of United Latin American Voters, League of Women Voters, the list goes on, Congressional Back Caucus. And the House went ahead and passed the legislation with the effects test by 389 to 24. 389 to 24. And in that legislation, the legislation included language which reflected the concern of the administration about whether the intent test was going to lead to either proportional representation or to to quote us. That language was included in the House legislation that passed. And it included the fact that members of a minority group have not been elected in numbers equal to the group's proportion of the population should not, and in and of itself, constitution a violation of this section. This addressed, for all intents and purposes, the concerns that the administration, I thought, and most of us, the civil rights community thought that they had with regard to the issue of proportional representation. You roughly remember that or aware remember, without, without... I certainly remember the provision in the, in the House bill so, at the time. So we also now included that language in the Senate bill. Now the House bill passed. The Senate bill had 61 co-sponsors prior to the time that we adopted the Dole Amendment. That legislation was on its way. That legislation was good as done, quite frankly. The Dole Amendment was effectively a restatement of what was in the House bill, and it had been included. But the administration after that said, well, if they're going to include that as the Dole Amendment, uh, we will let up in our opposition and will eventually uh, support it. Now, during the time after the passage of the House bill and prior to the passage of the Senate bill, you, even though the House had passed it, you were still strongly maintained the administration's position, did you not? Well, I was still working for the administration, right. Senator. Okay. President Reagan's position was to extend the act without change. As you mentioned, that was the Attorney General's position. I was a special assistant to the Attorney General, um, and I was doing my best to uh, implement their views and support their views. In your uh, memoranda that was uh, to the Attorney General 
Brad Reynolds now, the administration after the House bill, I think the history will show it, thought that the administration uh, should alter its position. It's, your memoranda said Brad Reynolds has expressed some reservation about circulating any written statement on the question to the Hill. My own view is that something must be done. I'd, maybe that's a staffer, but it's separating yourself from Brad <coughs> Reynolds, uh, who was the uh, leader on that this issue at the time. Then you. Oh well, with respect, Senator, right. the, my understanding, and I uh, looked at that memorandum okay. recently, is that the issue was whether or not to circulate something explaining the administration okay. position. And I didn't think it, Mr. Reynolds's view was you shouldn't do that because he didn't support the position. It was a question whether or not to circulate something at that time. And my view was whether or not. I thought if the administration was advocating its position, it ought to get the position out. Well, I think that's, that's good. You're a, a good advocate and a strong believer in this. The reason in this memoranda that you circle, and I have it right uh, here, and I make what parts of it uh, available to the committee, I mean to the, the record, in this in the latter last paragraph, you said, on the issue of the effects standard nationwide on the strength of the record will be constitutionally suspect, but also contrary to the most fundamental tenets of the legislative process which the laws of this country are based. Constitutionally suspect, effects test. The reason that I bring this up is to find out what you believed in then and what you believe today. Because you having raised in your memoranda the, that this is provision, the effects test is constitutionally suspect, is that still your position? Because if it is your position on an issue as important as the Voting Rights Act that resulted in the elections of hundreds and thousands of local leaders of color in all parts of the country, representatives in the House of Representatives, uh, and moved the whole democratic process uh, forward, then I think the American people are entitled to know. So specifically, specifically, uh, do you believe that the effects test in the Voting Rights Act, which is currently the law, is constitutional? Well, Senator, I don't know what the analysis, you read a clause of a sentence, and I would have to look at the whole memorandum and uh, to see exactly what the suggestion or the issue was in that case. Senator Kennedy, would you make the memo available sure. to him, please? Yeah. What, what, uh, what, what I'm interested in, in doing is asking now whether you believe that the effects <laughs> test is constitutionally suspect. I'm, uh, I'm interested I've, in today, quite frankly, yeah. Uh, more than what we had uh, ri written before, uh, whether you believe that it is sus uh, suspect today or whether you find that it is settled law. Just, uh, it's fine. If you want to obviously refer to it, but I'm interested in what's your view today, whether you... Well, what we're referring to, what I'm referring to in this paragraph uh, is the court's determination, and if I'm looking at this correctly, under Section 5, it's determination, the, the <coughs> language you read uh, notes the Supreme Court's conclusion under Section 5, which is the preclearance provision that applies to uh, jurisdictions with a history of discrimination. And what the court had said in that case was that uh, requirement of preclearance uh, was acceptable given the record that the Congress had established in the Voting Rights Act of 1965 of the practices in those jurisdictions. And the concern was that if you extend the effects test nationwide, that the record which had been established only with respect to particular jurisdictions uh, in the South wouldn't uh, apply nationwide, and that would be the basis for a constitutional challenge. Uh, the uh, 
application of the test under Section 2, which is, as you know, uh, it, we use the shorthand uh, effects test. It's actually the totality of the circumstances test, and it lays forth a number of considerations. And I think there's some argument about how it closely attracts the effects test under Section 5, or if it's, a, if it's a different totality of the circumstances approach. I'm not aware of any case that has questioned the uh, constitutionality of the application of the totality of the circumstances case under Section 2. And if an issue on that were to be presented to me um, on the Supreme Court, which it may be given the uh, pending extension uh, of the Voting Rights Act, I would, of course, confront that issue as a judge and not as a staff attorney uh, for an administration with a position. And as a judge, I would come to the issue with an open mind and I would fully and fairly consider any arguments that might be presented. I don't know if an argument is going to be presented uh, about uh, the application of the totality of the circumstances test nationwide. Uh, as again, I'm not aware of any challenges that have been presented to it uh, since it was enacted. I don't know if any will be if the, when the voting, if or when the Voting Rights Act is extended again. But if it is, I would confront that as a judge and not uh, uh, as a staff attorney for an administration with a particular position on that issue? Well, Judge, there hasn't been, at least that I know, uh, in the legal circles, uh, suspicion about the unconstitutionality of the effects test as it applies to Section 5. That has, that's, that's uh, as grounded as it can be. I'm asking the specific issue that was the really issue of tension with the extension and the really the most important part, historically, about the Voting Rights Act, whether you think that that provision is constitutionally suspect today. The, this is the backbone of uh, effective voting in our country and our society, and I think the American people are entitled to know whether you believe or suspect that that particular provision which has passed just overwhelmingly by the House and the Senate, signed by President Reagan, and has resulted in this extraordinary march to progress, is constitutionally sound. That's what I mean. I have no basis. I'm not aware of any constitutional challenge that has been brought to Section 2 since it was enacted. I've not, and, you know, I have no basis for viewing it as constitutionally suspect, and I don't. Um, if an issue were to arise uh, uh, before, before the Supreme Court or before the Court of Appeals, if I head back there, uh, I would consider that issue uh, uh, with an open mind in light of the arguments. I've got have no basis for viewing it as constitutionally suspect uh, today, um, and I'm not aware that it's been challenged in that respect uh, <coughs> since it was enacted. It may have been, but as I said, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Well, I, I gather you, you, you've had a an extensive answer that from that answer I did hear that it is not constitutionally suspect as far as your view today. Yes. Okay. Could I move on to the issue of affirmative action, please? Certainly. Um, in the Grutter uh, v. Bollinger case, the Supreme <laughs> Court decided, very close 5-4 decision, Sandra Day O'Connor, the deciding uh, individual Good justice. The Supreme Court upheld the university practices that considered race as one factor in its admission decisions. No one is talking today about quotas. We're talking about affirmative action as defined in this uh, Greta decision. The court found that there was a constitutional affirmative action program aimed at achieving a racially diverse student body. In this uh, decision, the court express, expressly gave great weight to the representation by military leaders, military leaders, that said highly quali qualified racially diverse officer corps is essential to the military's ability to fulfill its principal mission and to provide national security. What weight if, would you give to that kind of a comment or statement or testimony by the military in considering any issue dealing with affirmative action? Well, the weight it was given was to help satisfy the test, because the court, as you know, in Grutter, 
uh, applied strict scrutiny because it was dealing with considerations on the basis of race. And that required a showing of a compelling governmental interest to support that legislative action. And the testimony of the military officers, as the court explained, helped substantiate the compelling nature of the interest in having a diverse uh, student body. Um, and that was the, the, the weight that the court gave it. Um, uh, there was, of course, the other case. There were two Michigan cases, the law school case and the university case, the Gratz uh, case, where the court did say that it looked too much like a quota in that case because it was given determinative consideration as opposed to being one of a variety of factors that is, is considered. Um, and the two cases together kind of show where the court is coming out, at least in the area of higher education. Uh, the court permits consideration of race or ethnic background uh, so long as it's not sort of a make or break uh, test. Well, do you agree then with uh, Justice O'Connor writing for the majority that gave great weight to the real world impact of affirmative uh, policies in universities? And the reason I've got 35 seconds left that uh, you might say, well, this may eventually come on up before the court. But the fact is, we know how every other justice has voted because they've all voted. And the American people would like to know where you stand on this uh, very important public policy issue, particularly since Sandra Day O'Connor wrote such a compelling uh, decision that uh, was, I think, in the cause of uh, fairness and justice? Well, uh, Senator, I think I can answer the specific questions you, you asked because as you phrased the question, do you agree with her uh, that it's important to look at the real world significance and impact? And I can certainly say that I do think that that is the appropriate approach without commenting on the outcome or the judgment in a particular case, that you do need to look at the real world impact uh, in, in this area and I think in other areas as well. Thank you very much. My time's up. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you Senator Thank you, Kennedy. Senator. Uh, we will now take a 15-minute break. Okay. Uh, we will reconvene at uh, 11 uh, 25. <laughs> hearings for John Roberts, nominated to be Chief Justice. Senators have wrapped up the opening uh, round with two half-hour segments from Senator Brownback and Senator, uh, Senator Coburn of Oklahoma, and then into the 20-minute rounds. Several senators now speaking to reporters outside the hearing room.